You doing it from home? Hello, dear, uh, very good evening and welcome to uh, tonight's update, uh, Government in Transition. I'm your host, Elaine, and I have with me uh, Sanjeev Datta, an attorney at law. And of course, Sanjeev is a candidate of the People's Progressive Party Civic. And I also have Joe Hamilton, um, another candidate of the People's Progressive Party Civic and a former member of parliament. Sanjeev, Joe, good evening and welcome to the program. Hi, Eddie. Good night. Good night, viewers. Sanjeev, you're muted. Yes. Good evening, Eddie. Good evening, Joe. Good evening to your viewers and your listeners across Guyana. My pleasure to be here. All right. I want to get straight into this program um, because we are seeing a lot of evidence. This is what you call hard evidence, Joe and Sanji, coming out um, with regards to uh, positions taken. Um, we've had the one with Lowenfield in 2015 where he himself said, you know, it is almost impossible. Matter of fact, he said it's impossible for voter impersonation. Um, we are now seeing by his own admittance, uh, he is saying that um, he is really a creature of the Guyana Elections Commission. And therefore, any action um, of him must be based on directives of the Guyana Elections Commission, the commission and its chair. So what I'll probably do is maybe I should start. Yeah. I should start with this video, um, and then maybe we can we can get into um, into some discussions on this. So let me just pull this up quickly so that we can start uh, with the video. Uh, let me see what is happening here because I think it's it might be interesting um, for us to have a look at the the I don't want to call it hypocrisy. But to have a look at, um, the, I think I need to remind sometimes that this quotation. The I think I need to remind sometimes that this quotation in its constitutional agency established constitutionally after one one um, speaks very clearly to to establish the one. To the members of that commission and their responsibility. The commission shall be responsible for the efficient conduct uh, of elections, general and regional, local elections, and for the conduct of registration in the The commission by order, instruct the chief election officer for the conduct of all these subsets. They, they are contained in the, in the Constitution, where the commission shall direct the, the secretary to do. So is that a creation of an attitude of the part of the CEO that he will have to be provided with guidance. Constitution is in reference. We have been experiencing, we have been to those meetings. That is the chief election officer, the direction of the commission, which is membership is contained in So they direct. Sometimes when one hears that the CEO cannot meet with the team at location at your wife, I have not yet, I constitutionally mandated, uh, being provided with the guidance um, from the commission, chairman and commission. So I think we need to understand that from the country. One needs to understand context here. The secretary are doing what they have to do because you are surely being a student of management understand fundamentally what is going on.
so gentlemen those are the words of Pete Lowenke. He went through the paces. He explained that and, and, and confirmed that he has to, he can only act based on instructions from the commission. I'm going to start with you, Joe, and then I bring Sanjeev in. No, 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 if I, if I, in my recollection is that that was February. Uh, remember, the no confidence motion was in December, and the issue came up at that time about why he wasn't activating the secretariat to prepare for elections that should be held uh, in three months. And therefore, his escape arch was that, listen, I as CEO uh, couldn't uh, move forward unless I am instructed by the commission to do same. Uh, Eddie, you would also recall uh, uh, and viewers, at that time, the chairman of the commission was one James Patterson, who is one of the conspirators going back uh, in time. And therefore, Lowenfield and Patterson was conspiring at a time where Patterson was refusing to instruct him. And Lowenfield, on the other hand, was saying, I am waiting for instructions from Patterson. When the fact is, they didn't want to uh, keep the deadline of uh, the election that should have been held based on the Constitution uh, in, three, in, in three months. So that is what, uh, but we are not in doubt, and we were never in doubt, that is the People's Progressive Party civic, that Lowenfield is a creature of the Guyana Elections Commission. And I can go further to make the point that law and field is just a utensil of the Guyana Elections Commission. Uh, that can be disposed of at any time. You know, people got this view that um, the CEO is some, uh, is permanent like the commissioners. That is not so. The commissioners, uh, of course, something we have to look at when we are dealing with the issue of uh, reformation of the commission. The commission ours there are there for life is only their own resignation or death uh, can cause them to stop being a commissioner. That is not so with the chief executive office and all the other people in the secretariat. You will recall also viewers, um, when Claudette Singh uh, took over as chair of GECA, law and field contract was up. So this thing about he is, um, there in some permanence, that is not so. And uh, the chair at that time, she uh, voted to keep him because she indicated that she needed um, the historical knowledge uh, to help her in her work. And so that is, um, Eddie, that is what um, this despicable man does when it suits him. Uh, he says things, and the other the other um, video uh, that we have, when he was saying that that um, it is impossible to impersonate. Remember that time Granger they won the elections, so he was protecting them from any conversation about irregularity. This time they lost the election. So he is prepared on his master's behalf to uh, change his tune. But that is what um, liars and thieves and despicable people do. Uh, and I don't expect anything um, better from Keith and Field. He has shown who he is and what he is ever since he was there um, under the auspices of, of Patterson. The thing is, I, I suspect that the latitude he had on the Patterson, who was a, 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 a co-conspirator in the election shenanigans, he don't have that same latitude uh, with Claudia Singh, um, and that is a difficulty that he has. So he's trying to 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 uh, 
force himself, so to speak, on the commission by suggesting that his word carry the day, which is total baloney. Uh, Sanjeev, let me bring you in here. Um, and maybe you can, you can speak from a more legal perspective as well uh, with regards to Lowenfield's role at the commission and the structure of the commission per se, um, picking up from where maybe Joe left off. Um, Eddie, the position with Lowenfield, which he says on the recordings that you see doing the wrongs on social media now, uh, is accurate. It proves that he knows what it is. Essentially, there are two parts, if you want, is easier to describe it that way. There is the commission, which is made up of the six commissioners and the chairman, and there is the secretariat, which is headed by the CEO, who is Lowenfield. The role of the secretariat is to carry out the instructions of the commission. The commission comes up with all the decisions, all the policy, all the plans, and the secretariat is to execute it and fulfill it. It's like a company. The board of directors decide on what should happen, um, the plan of what should happen, the policies of what should take place, and then the staff is to implement all that has been decided upon and agreed upon. So that's what Lowenfield is. Lowenfield has previously said he's a constitutional officer. He's not. He's simply a statutory officer. And in his case, he's on a contract. So he has, as Joe was explaining, he has no security of tenure, like the, uh, the individuals who are commissioners uh, and the chairman have. Now, all of that, you have to take into the point of view of what he's been saying now versus what he said a year ago and in 2015. Those are the recordings that we're seeing. It is obvious that Mr. Lowenfield knows his role. It is obvious that he's enunciated on many occasions that he's awaiting instructions from the commission, that whatever the commission gives the instructions to do, he fulfills those instructions. Now, what is unusual about all of that is only a short time ago, which was last year, 2019, 2018, Mr. Lowenfield was saying repeatedly that he's awaiting instructions from the commission. He's waiting instructions from the commission whether he should go ahead and uh, make arrangements for an election within three months. He, was, he made it very clear that it was possible uh, following the no confidence motion. He needed to put things in place. He would do the necessary documents. He even went so far to say to one reporter that GCOM is always ready. Whatever is the position, whatever the instruction, they have the necessary uh, things in place to execute as soon as possible. And they have a time frame worked out for everything they do. Now, it is obvious that he recognizes this. How has he forgotten now? that what he has done in terms of now it is that he wants to decide what's valid and invalid votes. He put that in a report. The commission, the chairwoman of the commission has instructed him that he's to do certain things, which is he must produce his report based on the recount data. Now, he didn't do that because he's produced a report to that effect, but he didn't do that. And he is saying that he is a constitutional officer and he's entitled to do that. Well, we know he's not a constitutional officer and he's certainly not entitled to do what he wants. Now, this is a dangerous path that he is treading because we saw two charges that came up in the court today and they've been ordered to be served. We saw this evening a third charge has been uh, laid against Mr. Lowenfield. And from what I understand, there are more charges, more people are coming forward to lay charges against Mr. Lowenfield. He can't take this lightly. These charges are common law conspiracies and they carry imprisonment for substantial amount of time, maximum being life imprisonment. But if we just look at what those charges are, those charges are very, very simple. Anyone that's been following what's going on 
the misconduct in public office is easy. You're a public officer. You're supposed to conduct yourself in accordance with the law and the rules applicable to your status and position. He has clearly not been doing that. The other conspiracy charge that he has is about committing fraud. Now, you have to understand why these things are looming large in his activities. If you look at what he did, we all know that Mr. Loenfield has repeatedly made public statements that he receives the SOPs coming in on election night, and his office is running a tabulation of what all the SOPs are, so that he would have figures as to what the numbers should actually come up to. This is what Mr. Lowenfield does. This is what the CEO, in fact, does every election. These are the ones that, you know, they say that the commissioners get copies and they initial it. These are all part of all that process. However, if that is true, which is what he said repeatedly, then he would have known when Mr. Mingo went on a frolic of his own. He would have known when Mr. Mingo went to the fantasy numbers. And he should have not produced a report or supported that. He should have stood up and said, well, I am a public officer. I have a duty to the public. I have these SOPs. And here they are. These numbers do not match my numbers. But as I understand it, and if we go by what's in the public domain in the media, is he stopped that counting process of his own SOPs or he's alleging that he did. If he did, why would you do that? When you saw what was going on in relation to Mingo, when you saw the troubles that were arising in relation to Mingo, no responsible chief elections officer would have taken it upon himself to stop. You would have said, we need to work faster. We need to get to the bottom of this so I am informed and I am advised and I can make and advise the commission I can make decisions and advise the commission as to what is going on and what is the best course available to them. So the charges that he has against him, coupled with the fact that he has demonstrated in his own words and in his own language what his roles and functions are, and he has demonstrated that he has full knowledge of what is going on, then you put that, you juxtapose that with the recount data that has been produced that the whole world has seen live and the reports that he has produced. And you will realize that what he has done is he has gone along with the Mingo uh, numbers in the first place. And secondly, he has, he has gone along a path similar to others who have set about trying to undermine, fiddle with, and interfere with the numbers that have been obtained at the recount, which are the true numbers and reflective of the will of the Guyanese people. That's what CARICOM report was. So for Mr. Loinfield to now all of a sudden develop convenient amnesia, um, he went so far to say that he was a student of management. And that's what good management meant. You, you awaited your instructions from your board, in this case, the commission, and you carried it out. Now, he's apparently been doing that all the time before, so he's well aware of it. But on this particular occasion, when he's been given an instruction, he sees it differently. He would be well advised to do what he needs to do. And those who might be encouraging or conspiring with him and not the ones who are going to stand in that dock when that trial is going on. He would be well advised to simply carry out his functions in accordance with law, which he clearly appreciates. He understands what it is. So one can only hope. Um, thanks, Sanjeev. And uh, Sanjeev, when you look at the two contrasting positions, the position taken then, uh, maybe that was when he was in his professional mode. Um, and I think he has now moved into the mode of being a politician. Because I, I think most people would have seen uh, Lowen Field as a person uh, trying to wear two hats. I think, Joe, you keep making this point um, over and over on, on, on other programs that Lowen Field seemed to be wearing two hats. One, as the chief elections officer, 
and another hat as a politician. Tanjiv, you touched on those charges, and I understand um, that they carry some serious penalties. I think life in prison. Um, <laughs> they do, Ed. They, 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 they're common law conspiracies which would carry life imprisonment. Um, there are other issues that he has to be aware of. These are three charges. So there are three separate charges. Um, convictions, the rules of sentencing, and the rules that would apply is if you've been on your first conviction, you know, you're likely to have a, lean, a more lenient sentence. Second time, you're, you're a repeat offender, but a double repeat offender you are running closer and closer to the maximum that you can get. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing that I was saying that occurred to me when you were saying that um, Mr. Lowenfield went into professional mode and now he's changed into his mode. I see all over social media and I hear people saying the answer to all of this is something called Millie's hideout. I'm not sure exactly what it relates to. Don't Millie's hideout. <laughs> but Millie's hideout is apparently the answer to much of this. But one of the things we have to remember, Ed, the functions of a public officer. You see, public officers are officers who perform functions in a, usually a statutory body for the benefit of the public. So his task which is what he's paid for and which is what he's been engaged in doing is really, yes, he carries out the, the tasks as assigned to him by the commission, but his function of what he's doing is really to perform a service and a function for the members of the public. Now, it is performing for the members of the public because he is the person who is tasked with when they do the statements of recount and uh, for the, each regions, when they tabulate up the 10 regions, his task of what he really has to do is the returning officers in those regions tabulate the regions. So it, it's a process, right? That goes with seniority because seniority is, is expected to have better judgment, more experience and more capable of addressing what has to be done. So it works this way. Um, the presiding officer counts the ballots in the polling station. That presiding officer's ultimate boss is Mr. Lowenfield. You know, he's the chief elections officer. But then the, the presiding officer reports of what they have done. So the presiding officer counts the votes then and put them all there by boxes. Then the returning officer counts the boxes and put them all in regions. And then the chief executive officer, the, who is the ultimate boss, again, of all the returning officers, he then counts the regions, and he gives you what the country is. So he has a specific role to play. He can't go below yeah, where he is. Look at from this perspective. Um, Sanji, sorry to cut you here. But from yeah. this perspective, uh, this is almost like helping to define what he needs to present to the commission, I suspect. Um, yes, you because you see, he can't go below into the ballot boxes where the, the presiding officers were engaged. And he can't go into the region, the regional things where the returning officers were engaged in doing the calculation and counts. His job is really to take the 10 regions. That's all he, he can't go and interfere with the other ones. Because if you look at ROPA, the representation of the people like the presiding officer also is a statutory officer and has statutory functions, which he can't impinge on. He is the boss in terms of the secretariat. He is the superior. He is the person they answer to in the chain of command. Then the So it's the presiding officer, the returning officer, then the chief executive officer. But now... He can't tell them what to do because the returning officer is similarly in the representation of the People's Act, a statutory officer who has statutory functions that them alone can do. So what Lowenfield is doing with this foolish report that he comes up with to take away 115,000 votes, he has interfered with the polling officer's tasks. He's interfered with the returning officer's tasks. 
we don't know which boxes and which region these things are from, specifically because he just feels he doesn't even need to give an explanation for that. Not that he had any power to do it, even if he has an explanation. He has no authority. But what he is trying to say, that if in his mind, the polling officer or the returning officer has some problem, he has some residual power to fix all of it. Nonsense. Total and utter nonsense. His job it? is to count the regions. The 10 regions and tell the chairman and the commission, these are the totals. I want to bring in Joe here because Joe, you have the experience of GCOM. You played a role, I think, uh, many years ago uh, with regards to um, the whole setup of GCOM itself. Um, but I don't want us to go too far back into, into, into the past because the fact of the matter is what we have before us is fraud by low and field. But, um, Picking up from where Sanji would have left off there, Joe, uh, with your institutional knowledge of the system. Two issues I would want to point to. Um, if you recall, uh, sometime at election preparation, very close to elections, uh, the People's Progressive Party Civic asked to see the chairman and the commissioners. There were two fundamental issues that we needed to ensure the commission vice chair person clarified. One, if you recall, the major issue with the conspiracy of Lowenfield and Myers and team, when on the Low East Coast, specifically the Monrepo, uh, Lusignan area, they sought to put in Monrepo 7,000 people in one school, if you recall that issue. And that was a way of attempting to disenfranchise um, people because they, uh, the school didn't have the, uh, uh, the e egress and ingress uh, for, for a suit flow of 7,000 electors. We sought to say to the chairperson that you have to ensure that we have more polling stations in that in that community. Loinfield at that time, and, uh, and Sanjeev is so right, when we pressed him at a meeting, he said as much as Zulfikar spoke to him, he couldn't act because he need to be instructed by the commission to establish more polling places in the Monrepo's area. And the other important issue uh, that Sanji raised was what had been happening on the Surge Valley is that Loyan Field or the Secretariat over those period in the election usurp the authority of the returning officers. And that is the reason why we used to have all of the problems because it was the secretariat who was seeking to churn out information to the public, utilizing statements of polls when they should not be doing that. Uh, Law and field statements of polls submitted to him is for housekeeping purposes that he can validate the, uh, the, 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 the numbers sent in by the returning officers. But that function, and that is where the, the, the chickenery and skullduggery could happen because uh, this manipulation can happen there. We demanded of the commission to follow the law and the statute. And what is the law as Sanjeev outlined? That the presiding officers will in certain sections, make available all of the statements of poll to the deputy returning officers and all the deputy returning officers in that region, uh, district will make all the statements of poll available to the uh, returning officer of the district. And we demanded that all the declarations of every district must be made in the district. 
That is one of the things that throw their plan uh, a wire. Because at the level of, of, of GCOM, at the secretariat, they didn't have total control of all the de uh, documents as regard declaration. And by the third, we already had all nine returning officers declaring in every district. So that created problems. The last election, if you recall, with um, fake statements of poll and all the kind of thing, everything was being managed at the level of GCOM, uh, at the secretariat. The other point is that um, they were not able to do, to do what they set out to do. They wanted to manipulate the elections outcome at GCOM, and that was taken away from them because of the demands made by the opposition leader and team at that time. The other point was, Lowenfield refused to do what all elections uh, chairman ever, ever since from Rudy Collins right back, where they normally made available statements of poll that is at the secretariat to the commissioners for review. At this election, Lowenfield denied the chairperson and the commission the opportunity to review and sign off on statements of polls. And up to this moment, he has refused to make the statement poll uh, available to them. So yes, um, Stanjeev uh, is right that they have separate statutory functions. But in times past, um, the Secretariat uh, usurped the authority of, 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 the, of the returning officers, of the, the presiding officers, but they weren't allowed to do that this time. And therefore, you could have seen the fraud easily because we, only have what, we were only dealing with one district. If they were dealing with all 10 districts at the at GCOM secretariat, and you had 10 frauds happening, we would have had a difficulty. Uh, and I suspect my uh, opinion is that 2015, I believe manipulation happened because all the tabulation was done at the secretariat, but they didn't get the opportunity to do it this time in 2020. But when you look at these pieces, you take all these pieces and you put them together. Um, there's a significant amount of evidence to prove what Lowenfield, what um, Mingo and the others were trying to do. And I, I think you brought a different perspective there, Joe, by talking about why the declarations were made at the region, at the level of the regions or the districts, and how it, 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 it impacted their plan. Um, a lot of you may have not looked at it through that perspective, but I want to go back to a little bit to low field numbers and low field role and, and what is required of him. Low field himself said in that tape that he has to await instructions or he acts only on instructions from the commission. The fact of the matter is low field received instruction to prepare his report. He did that. Um, the commission met, and Lowenfield subsequently, I think it was the 16th or the um, of June, if I'm if I'm correct, or maybe the 13th of June, somewhere there, where he received instructions again to prepare the final report, which simply means to put to use the numbers from the recount and allocate seats. What Lowenfield did is to depart from that process. He went rogue. Um, and like you said, he usurped the functions of the returning officer, of the presiding officer, and everybody else, and decided that he's going to sat down somewhere and, and take away votes, um, mainly from the PDP, and hand APNU, in the first instance, he handed them a two-thirds two majority, then he decided to give them a one-seat majority, uh, majority. So... Clearly, Lowenfield was informed by the, by the commission. He was instructed by the commission to do the right thing. But he chose to go a different route. 
Ed, you have me laughing when you said that, man. You said that Lowenfield decided to give them first two thirds and then he gave them a one seat majority. But you're right. Lowenfield is be- behaving as if he decides. If that were so, then why bother go to the polls? Why why is anybody going to vote? Just phone up Lowenfield and say, what's the result? Because he wants to distribute it in accordance with what he wants. And there is something that we have to realize here, Ed. Never before, at least in my time, and in my experience with the electoral process in Guyana, have we seen such open, uh, obvious, and transparent attempts to rig the election where everyone is aware of it. I know that there is a tit for tat on the social media platforms and in, in terms of, if you say politics, because what they, uh, the coalition spin doctors are trying to do is come up with explanations for everything. <laughs> so then it becomes the opposition. It becomes our job to debunk one at a time at a time. So it becomes now almost a contest of whatever they would put versus, but there is no dispute, even with the APNU spin doctors that Mingo's numbers were a fantasy and they were a figment of his imagination and he made them up. No one disputes that anymore, not even remotely. No one disputes that Lowenfield had SOPs and was doing a tabulation at GCOM by his own staff with his own thing and he claims he stopped that. Nobody disputes that. No one disputes what the recount number data are for each parties and what is the final count. No one disputes that. But yet, Lowenfield goes and he comes up with numbers that are not those numbers. Now, he might have discarded 115,000 votes, but if he had discarded one vote, it's just an, it's similarly an egregious wrong. He has no power to decide what votes to discard and what votes to keep. How, how could he do that? He comes up with the explanation, essentially, of one bad apple spoiling the box, uh, the whole barrel. He's saying that if there is one element that he can identify or there is one element about the box that does not meet his satisfaction, he discards all the ballots in that box. Now, if you say it out loud, it's so preposterous. I mean, how could you embark upon something like that with no power or ability to do any of that? How would he conduct these evaluations that he alleges? You hear the judges in the Court of Appeal saying about quantitative and qualitative. It, it doesn't matter which one it is, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. What his task was and what his task, his only task is, is to do a tabulation and to put it together. Now, if he is refusing to do that, we all know that the commission has the power. The question that is more important than what can the commission do if he refuses to do what he is doing, the more important question to me is, why is he choosing to do that? Why is he choosing not to follow the recount data? Why is he choosing not to tabulate his SOPs? And why is he choosing to discard 115,000 votes? There There seems to be no logical reason for why he should do any of those things. But he does it, and then he insists it's his right. Now, even if we were to take it further down the road, Joe, and say, yes, it's his right. And somewhere there is a law that says that he has to do it. Why would he want to do that, would be the question. Your job is to let the chairman know what is the result of the vote count. That is essentially all your task is. Now, why you want to go into this whole headache of assessing which ones you're going to count, which ones you're going to leave out, how are you going to do it and how are you going to declare it? There, there is absolutely no reason for him to want to do that. Unless, of course, 
he has a, a vested interest and he has an agenda and he wants to keep that vested interest and he wants to look out for the agenda which he set out to do, you know? So I can't imagine why any of these things would happen. And it's so plain and obvious to all concerned that this is what's going on. So, Joe, I think we lost Ed. <laughs> it looked like we were on our own here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well was, was Ajib, you're so right that, that when he presented to the chair the 460,000 votes that were validly cast and recounted, that whole number was derived from 10 separate numbers. In the case of this uh, fiction that he presented to the uh, GCOM, 345,000, it is just a whole number. No one is aware where are and how the 10 numbers reflect to that whole number. It's just, it's just an old number. He didn't utilize at all 10 numbers to, 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 to create that 345,000. And the fact that it is the district tabulation that becomes the national tabulation, you could have run off on a frolic and just gave us, gave us a national um, tabulation. And that is what he did that he's not authorized to do in the first place. And secondly, uh, there is nothing he can rely on. In the case of the 460,000 votes coming out of the recount, he can rely on the 10 tabulation certificate signed on to by his um, coordinators for the district. In this case, apparently he has created his own numbers, even at the level of, 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 the, of, the, of the district uh, to come up with his whole number. But he hasn't said that, but the point is, all he presents is an whole number and we're yet to know um, where he got it from. Uh, there's no explanation about it. And of course, he attempted to utilize the uh, decision coming out of the court of appeal. Uh, to, to, to make his, um, his judgment and to make his call and to pre, uh, present that depiction that he, he presented to the commission uh, a couple of weeks ago. But Joe, we recall that what happened with the Court of Appeal proceedings, um, I know the matter is before the CCJ and barring the obvious things that have been said about it, it would be best if we refrain. Um, I am involved and wouldn't want to speak about matters in too much detail about what's going on in the court. But we would recall that it was in media and it was all over social media that Mr. Harmon's attorneys pointed out quite rightly that there was nothing that would be um, or there was nothing that was in the judgment to give any guidance or clarity as to what was a valid vote. So what guidance did he receive? begs the answer. The other issue that I guess we have um, that comes out of that, which to me um, is even a little bit more troublesome, is we have seen since Wednesday an escalation and an advancement in the, the sanctions discussion and the, the movement towards sanctions are now more direct and ongoing. And Mr. Lowenfield surely has to know that when uh, the Secretary of State of the United States says all those who are involved or associated or benefiting from the rigging of the elections are going to face sanctions, he must realize that he places himself not only at the, in the criminal law in Guyana, but he, he poses a problem with uh, proceeding with suffering from international sanctions from thing. Now, why would a man want to put himself through so much and to have to, add, uh, to deal with so much issues 
relating to charges, relating to sanctions, when all he really has to do uh, is do his job. If he does his job in the, in the spirit and the letter of the law, which governs him, then it would be a rather straightforward process. He wouldn't be having to worry about going to a court. He wouldn't have to be worrying about being uh, the subject of sanctions. And from, as I said before, from my understanding, there are more proceedings that are going to be filed. More people are coming forward and they want to, to file charges against Mr. Mingo and Mr. Loenfield because they feel that there was some sort of a, uh, a conspiracy between them to defeat the will of the people, you know? So but Jim, these sanctions... Quickly, um, if, you, if you can touch on um, to guide the viewers, uh, one, if you recall at the, at the hearing last uh, Monday, uh, the CCJ, I think it was Justice Witt, asked the question whether uh, any citizen has um, uh, filed civil proceedings against the chief elections officer because he, 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 he was frustrated that all this thing he heard uh, was coming up that a chief elections officer uh, did and was doing. Uh, he couldn't understand it at all. And so for the benefit uh, of the viewers and even my be be uh, own benefit is uh, we know there are criminal charges filed and more are to be filed. Uh, what are the possibilities also for uh, civil uh, uh, matters being brought before the court against the chief elections officer uh, and, and, and the returning officer Mingo. Oh, well, the thing is, Joe, what has happened, what is the process is this. Misconduct in public office, which is a criminal offense and for which a charge has been laid by, I believe that's the one where Josh Kanai is the virtual complainant. So there is misconduct in public office. A charge has been laid to that effect against Mr. Lowenfield. Misconduct in public office is, however, a civil wrong as well, a tort, for which a citizen can sue him or a political party or any interested person can sue him for damages. So because what that is, is it gives the people, the citizen and the interested person, the ability to sue you on penalty that you pay damages to them when you are not doing your public duty. And the person who is entitled to bring such proceedings must only show that they are affected by you not doing your job as the law requires you do your job. Now, that appears to be a situation in the current uh, scenario, every voter would be entitled because every voter has a vested right in having a fair declaration of the uh, results in accordance with the wishes of the majority because that's what you expect in an election. That's the whole purpose you have the franchise to vote at an election. So for Lowenfield to again embark on a process that he is and for Mingo to, to embark on the process that they did, knowing fully well that citizens can come forward and sue them personally for damages. It's a really dangerous, they're treading on very thin ice because they might open themselves up to so much uh, civil liability as well as criminal liability. So, and, so, so um, you're, you're endorsing uh, the comment, uh, Sanjeev, that the, that the uh, CCJ Justice with, uh, made or the query um, that, that uh, civil, char civil uh, matters also can be brought against law and field in his own right, I, I, I suspect, um, uh, as Keith Law and Field. Um, the, 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 the other thing, um, and I, I see Eddie is back with us. Uh, yeah, I got 
I got knocked out <laughs> the internet just now. So I had to, to find a way to get back into the meeting that I'm hosting. <laughs> yeah, the, the other but, thing was, uh, is Eddie, the, I Sanji was looking at so, it and I'm wondering who is going to let you in because <laughs> I'm looking at that. Sanji, I'm looking I, at, I made oh. contact via, uh, via um, WhatsApp. I and figured. he said he had some technical difficulties. So, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I saw, I saw when you were doing that. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. <laughs> The, the, the other thing is that with all of this that we have uh, put before the public um, via these programs, people will wonder why would Granger says that he is depending on law field numbers? I mean, uh, so he must know better. And, and uh, uh, and that is the point today um, Ralph Gonzalez made, that the people who are chastising and castigating the outgoing chair and he himself, uh, they are, are looking at this matter through what he called Jandis eyes. Because uh, Arman is a lawyer, Ramjatan is a lawyer, Nagamoto, even though not a good lawyer, is a lawyer. Um, trot <laughs> Trotman is a lawyer, and, and Granger, and, and many of them, um, some of these guys were people who were involved as the most senior level in the disciplined services. So they must know better. So why would they go down the road, uh, in the case of Ramjatan, saying that he is expecting that they might be able to win the elections on a technicality? I mean, you know, the pollster of, um, of, of the PNC, who has been their pollster for the, over 25 years, Peter Wickham, said it um, simply. He said an elections is about votes cast, and the person who gets the most votes, they win the election. It's as simple as that. There is no technicality you can win it by, uh, but Ram Jatan, as a lawyer, is hoping that perhaps they can win... Uh, the, the elections on a technicality, I don't, I don't know how. So what it is showing is that how pathetic uh, Granger and his cabal has been because they know that firstly, low and field answers to the commission are not the other way around. And secondly, they know that low and field numbers could not be plucked out of the air. It has to come through a process, as you explained, Sanji, a process coming from the presiding officer to the returning officer and then to the chief elections officer. In the case of the recount, they, 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 um, they authorize persons and they style their name differently, but it's the same work they were doing, the same task. Uh, yes. the, 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 the supervisors for the station. Supervisor. Uh, in the same task, and then you had the coordinator of the region, which is basically performing the functions like a returning officer. And all of those persons, they, after the tabulation of the individual districts, they, they sent it to low and field to just add the 10 numbers. And Granger, and they, 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 know, they would know all of that. But still, they continue to deceive themselves and their supporters that maybe something can happen somehow for them to win an election that they didn't get the vote, votes for to win. Well, you recall that uh, I'm, I'm quite disappointed in, in Mr. Ramjadan because I tell you what, there is a recording of his voice clearly saying that um, this is what has happened. He's sad about it. The declaration is likely to come tomorrow or the next day they've lost by about 15,000 votes. It's sad news, He's, it's, he feels really bad. It's one of his worst days ever that um, serving as a minister was the best thing he did. He went through the whole thing. He denied it immediately afterwards that day. He, he denied it later saying he, de de he never said that. Then of course the recording was made public. He appeared this morning on radio or oh, television in uh, Trinidad to say that what it was, uh, that wasn't it. That he was saying that he's leaving there, he's going to the prime minister's office. Now, 
the thing about the lies and the stupidity of what he says, there must be something that he is afflicted by. And, and what it has to be is he must be thinking by some quirk of the world that what he says in Trinidad, nobody in Guyana ever hears about. Or what he says on television over there, nobody gets any knowledge of it. So that when you go overseas, you can lie. Or when you speak to the overseas media, you can lie. This is ridiculous. It is, and this is common of much of what they do. It is so transparent and childish that within five minutes of them saying it, you can effectively debunk it. The same thing with Mr. Lowenfield. Mr. Lowenfield said that he had his right to do so. He's a constitutional officer. And then all these recordings turn up where he's saying very clearly that he is, must take instructions from the commission. And that's how it works, that he's a secretariat, they're the commission. They tell him what to do and he does it. Now, this is just preposterous that all of these such simple, transparent lies, persons are taking it upon themselves to do. Why would they do that? They're public offices. I mean, everyone knows they're lying. They don't believe they've won an election. They're oh. simply saying, as Granger said, that he will go along with what Lowenfield did. So Lowenfield is the one who's, get, uh, who's got to do the dirty job of going and lying about the votes, and they will simply follow it. But I don't know why you're asking that question, Sanjeev. Why would they lie? Why would they lie? I sat down this afternoon and I was trying to make a list of the number of people in the coalition who have been lying to the public openly. And you'd be surprised to see the number, you know? So we shouldn't be surprised at them lying. They have lost the elections. Since they started the license with regards to the elections results since the 3rd of March. So we know that. But in all this madness, and I want to conclude maybe on this note because we're almost out of time. In all this madness, Joe, in all this hunger for power, in all everything that they're doing, um, inclusive of, 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 of them looking not only their supporters, but an entire nation in the, in the face, and lie to them to say, Washington and the international community are bluffing when it comes to sanction. <clears throat> and it will be remiss of us if we don't discuss the issue of sanction. Interestingly, this evening, my, my wife brought my attention to a post by one James Bond, where he outlined sanctions and, 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 and the actions that could be taken. Could you imagine his attempt maybe is to say this is what if he is wishing for the people of Guyana? And I want to say from up front that the PP don't want Guyana to be sanctioned. But and, and it could be it, this could end quickly and, and, and simply if Granger concede he lost the elections. <clears throat> but excuse me, I was looking at the at the list and he outlined sanctions that usually the, the various forms that it it would take. The Kabbal, before you go, I just want to make this one point. You have a group of people who are so selfish that they are willing to put our nation at risk. They have already embarrassed us on the international community. They have decimated our, our, our diplomacy with their actions. Now they are willing, for the sake of power, to allow, and they can deal with the individual sanctions. I have no difficulty with that. But I know sanctions <coughs> usually progress. And from individual, it would move to, to, to banks, it would move to businesses, etc. And that will hurt our country, Sanjeev. You see, Ed, the issue of sanctions uh, um, is this. The belief is that sanctions are, you know, we don't need to worry, and they're behaving as if they don't need to worry, but they don't realize personal individual sanctions are paralyzing because what it does is it freezes your ability to do 
any form of business or financial or business transaction with the outside world. But then the institutions in here, if they do business with you, they are also not going to be permitted to do business with the outside world. So, for example, the banks in Guyana who have corresponding banks in the United States are not going to be allowed to do anything or they're not going to want to do any business with you because they sanctions mean that they can't do that. So the over, not wanting to violate the, the standard of whatever regulation or uh, law, the mandatory effect of it by the U.S. government, they can't do anything. But it doesn't only affect you. It affects your family, your wife, your children. But it also affects your brothers, your sisters, your nieces, your nephews, your father, your mother. It affects everybody. And the reason why they do that is because they, if you ever gave your cousin $1,000 or $500, they're going to be under the watch because they want to know where the money come from. How did this happen? Then comes the sanction where they will simply restrict travel. You and members of your immediate family, at least, are going to not be allowed to travel. But that has a knock-on effect to affect the population because everybody doing a bank transfer thereafter would have to provide a little bit more data and details because Guyana is a small country and they recognize this. Everybody kind of knows everybody. So they want to make sure that uh, one of the persons who are affected by the sanctions and prevented from doing anything is not going to his neighbor or his cousin or his school friend and giving them to transfer the money. So everybody who does that, they're going to be brought under that pressure. That means exporting things are going to be more difficult and slower, um, which means foreign currency is going to become a problem. So it's a snowballing effect of what would happen. But the sanctions that would be meted out to the individuals are effectively going to put them in a position where they are going to be in isolation. If businessmen go along with that, those businessmen and their families will never be allowed to travel to these overseas destinations anymore. They're not going to be allowed to own properties in Miami and New York. They're not going to be allowed to own businesses, go shopping. None of those things are going to be allowed. Their credit cards are going to be frozen. This is not going to be, they don't impose sanctions on you lightly. That's why it takes a little while. And they don't do it just to say that we have imposed sanctions. They do it. Sanctions are imposed to punish you for what you have done and to try to make you do the right thing. But it is intended, the fundamental purpose of, a san of sanctions are to punish you. Now, this means that, Mr., that President Granger and his family are going to all be subject to sanctions, which would mean his children, uh, his, his in-laws, his, his daughter and son-in-laws, I mean, wh whatever it is, nieces, nephews, all of that, uh, grandchildren, all of these people are going to be put at risk. And I find it very hard to believe that those who are trying to hang on to power and those who are doing everything in their power to try to corrupt this election and to rig this election would risk their entire family's well-being for the sake of what? A few dollars more. That's what it comes down to. We see up to this morning, up to yesterday in the newspapers again, transfers of land are being advertised and are going merrily along as if there's business as usual. Uh Eddie and Sanjeev, what is laughable about all of this is that a couple nights ago, David Hines, Burke, and Benchcock, these three, um, I'm looking for a, a word to, 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 to <laughs> see. Uh, maybe, I can't say, maybe I can't say the word in public. Because children might be listening. Joe, Joe, don't say, don't say publicly. Well, He'll get but the, the Trump. point is, these three men live in the United States, and they're saying to the Guyanese people, the supporters of Granger here, 
continue to fight them. You can live and bear the sanctions. You understand me? They're, they're not here. I mean, it, it is so laughable. You know, they are living. One is in Arizona, Arizona. The other two was either in Brooklyn or New York somewhere. And they have a program interviewing each other. And the team of the program is don't let the PVP take power. You down there continue to fight. Forget about the sanctions. Oh, they went further, they say. Bear the pressure with the sanctions under Trump. Elections in America will be in November. And when the Democrats get into government, they will remove the sanctions. I mean, this is, this is madness, you know? But, but Joe, the, the gullibility of the supporters here who are cheering them on, that's the problem. You know, it, it, it is trying to suggest to the ignoramuses that American policy does not transcend mm. uh, political establishment and political parties. Better look to Cuba. That, that is what they, they, they attempt. But but it, it is it is so. Sometimes you wonder uh, whether is sanity or insanity, because for people to accept what these guys are saying. And they're not coming here to be to punish like you. It means that something is happening with, with these people there. But yeah, and, and I agree with you. We're gonna wrap up, we're gonna wrap up now, but and you have people here are cheering them on to say we're with you, you know, we're with you. And that is part of our problem. The people who are stoking the fire, the people who are trying to who are who are coming up with all the divisive rhetoric, the people who are, are inciting are the ones who are living comfortably. Many of them are living comfortably in their basements in, 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 in Brooklyn or somewhere. And that's the problem. Now they say, Eddie, now they tell, now, now they're saying, um, you all must be prepared to protest if Mia Motley or, or um, Ralph Gonzalez come to um, Guyana to protest. Some have said, some of these madmen, they have said, Time to leave CARICOM. I mean, I mean, you, you know, people sometimes they wonder what has happened to the supporters of Granger. Uh, it looked like everybody um, need to go by the Kanji Bridge because as the day goes by, they're becoming madder and madder. They're saying things that are don't make sense uh, every day. And the leader, Granger, he is as mad as they are, or madder, because he himself, he is saying things, and whilst he's speaking about the math, he's contradicting himself. So mm. you wonder sometimes whether everybody need uh, checking out a Dr. Harry or Dr. Macri, uh, all the supporters of, of, of the APNU AFC. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. But I believe Dr. Harry has a lot of clients very soon. Um, that, that list is, is building. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining me this evening. Um, I, I do apologize for disappearing just now. Um, no, that's all right, Dad. These things happen. Of, of the internet, the network just went off. I thought you were yeah. off, actually. Um, and then I realized, I checked my phone, I realized it was still on. So, gentlemen, again, thank you uh, for being part of the program. Uh, this evening and to our viewers we want to say yes. thank you so much for being part of good night ed good night joe good night to our viewers and you, listeners good night. may your god be with you we're going to be back tomorrow at 10 a.m to give you another update until then we urge all of you to be safe as possible remember if you're going out to wear a mask uh, these numbers yes are rising, so numbers know. are rising everybody needs to be really careful take good care have a good night gentlemen.